Hall of Fame quarterback Kurt Warner caused a bit of a stir on social media amidst his assessment of Tua Tungvaloa. So we have him on the show here today to talk further in depth about the Miami Dolphins, their offense, and their decision looming to pay or not pay Tua. You are Locked On Dolphins, your daily Miami Dolphins podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, Miami. Welcome to another episode of Locked on Dolphins. It is your team every day here on the Locked on Network. I'm your host, Kyle Krabs, a lifelong Miami Dolphins fan, host of Locked on Dolphins, co-host of Locked on NFL Scouting. You can find our shows on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Tip of the cap to our everydayers because it is your team every day. We don't just say it. We live it here on the Locked On Network. Today's episode of Locked On Dolphins is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. And boy, oh boy, am I fired up for this one. Uh, I don't have the rundown of all the guests that Travis Wingfield has had on during his time as the host of Locked On Dolphins before he left to join the Dolphins organization and do the Drive Time podcast. Uh, but I can tell you this, I've had some great guests on this program throughout my tenure as the host of the show. This one's probably going to take the cake. Hall of Fame quarterback, Kurt Warner, uh, provided some assessment of Tua Tagovailoa last week, asking his followers about the outlook of the best anticipatory throwers in the game. He proceeded to spotlight Tua. Kurt's done a number of uh, film breakdowns on YouTube. Uh, for the Dolphins and Tua in the Mike McDaniel offense over the past two seasons, even some from the disastrous 2021 season where we had co-offensive coordinators and another guy who was calling plays to start the year. <laughs> and uh, uh, the insight that Kurt has always given has been great. And there's some really fascinating parallels between Kurt as a player and what we've seen thus far with Tua. And I reached out and, and happened to get a, a yes to have Kurt Warner on the show. So we're not going to waste any more of your time. We're going to dive right in with Hall of Fame quarterback Kurt Warner uh, to talk about Tua Tungvaloa in depth here today on Locked on Dolphins. The man I'm joined with today needs no introduction on the show, but we're going to give him one anyway. A current NFL Network analyst, Kurt Warner, is a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame's class of 2017, two-time NFL MVP, Super Bowl 34 MVP, and the point man of the NFL's greatest show on turf. Kurt's story is an incredible one. If you aren't familiar with it, I recommend you watch uh, American Underdog, the biopic film. Uh, Kurt also said some nice things about Tua Tungvalo recently on the internet and made him the latest uh, in this debate that we're seemed to be doomed to endure on a daily basis for the rest of time, uh, which brings us here today on Locked on Dolphins. Kurt, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day and joining me here on Locked on Dolphins. You got it. Good to be on with you. So, I wanted to give you the opportunity first and foremost for anybody who's not familiar with kind of where you stand on Tua Tungvaloa as a player uh, to kind of get them up to speed as far as how you view him overall as a player now that we're four years into his NFL career as the Dolphins kind of on this decision on whether or not to pay him. Yeah, you know, when I watch tape on all the quarterbacks in the NFL, um, you know, I break them down as a whole, you know, trying to look at all the different things that they do, the things that they do really, really well. Maybe the things they do well that's different than what other guys do. And then you try to, and I don't even really want to say rank them. Uh, you know, more importantly for me, I try to assess or analyze who they are as a quarterback, what they do well, where they need to improve if they want to become great. So uh, the thing about Tua is he's been really good the last couple of years. Uh, I'm not putting him in that great category, but I always like to preface that with there's only a few of those guys uh, at any given time in the NFL, you know, any era where you say, you know, this guy is, you know, one of the greats. This guy, to me, I talk about franchise quarterbacks a lot. And to me, a franchise quarterback is a guy that you believe if nothing else happened on, on the offense, that you could put the ball in that quarterback's hands 40, 45 times, and he could give you a chance to win every time out. So there's only a handful of those guys. But there are some things that I believe Tua is elite at. Um, maybe does better than anybody in the National Football League. And those things are his ability to anticipate 
uh, get the ball out quick. Um, and he's got great accuracy uh, in doing that. And so that to me is where he separates himself, where, you know, you've seen this offense be one of the best offenses in the league for the last couple of years. And it primarily stems from those skills of Tua connected with uh, Coach McDaniel's uh, offense and what they're trying to do. And they fit perfectly together. And so that's where he excels. That's where this offense excels. And you watch them week in and week out. They want to try to do the same sort of things every week. And when they're allowed to do that, they are tough to stop. Uh, you know, Coach, Tua, and then obviously the incredible weapons they have, starting with Tyreek Hill, uh, to be explosive. For me, where Tua needs to get better and where this offense needs to get better is when option number one isn't there um designing plays that give to a uh you know a full gamut of things if the defense takes this away then this should be open or this should be open so i think they need to improve scheme wise in that regard and then to uh, his ability to go beyond number one I, they've been so good offensively at getting to that number one option and with to a strength um you could look at the tape sometimes and go man he, he's forcing that a little bit you know he's forcing that throw but he gets away with it a lot because of that anticipation and that accuracy but where it comes to haunt you is when that guy really isn't open when there really is no option to throw it and we're trying to force it in there or we get stuck on that option too long and then we're not able to progress through that and get the ball to our secondary and, and our third receiver and that to me is where they have struggled uh, especially against good teams, right? Good teams are going to take away what you do best and they're going to force you to win away from your strength. And that to me is what Tua and this Miami Dolphins has to have to prove to the league is that when you take that away, we can still win in big moments against good teams. There's a lot of good stuff there that I want to get into, but uh, I'm glad you invoked the word anticipation. Uh, I know you posted recently uh, that you were watching some old games of yourself and one of your greatest strengths, anticipation, could also be one of your greatest weaknesses at time. Uh, you continue to go on, say, the ability to hit small windows, releasing the ball early, like you were just saying, how Tua can get away with that at times, mm -hmm. even if it's not necessarily the ideal progression to go to. Um, but then you get something a little different with the wide receiver and it hits the defensive back in the numbers as compared to what right. you expected that receiver to do. Uh, there's this great debate around a lot of fans around anticipation, and I, I think you're uniquely qualified to kind of weigh in on it because of how you played the game. So when you consider the elements of the position, whether it's throwing the ball as the receiver gets to the top of the break or maybe post-snap leverage from a defensive back or throwing to a spot with timing, what do you consider yourself to be the anticipatory elements of playing the position of quarterback? Yeah. Well, let me just say this first is that, you know, I look at anticipation similar to a lot of people look at the ability to extend a play, um, you know, because we have so many great athletes in this league now. And, you know, we've got a number of, uh, you know, quarterbacks that are tremendous athletically and they may not have the anticipation piece. So they may miss out on that part of the play, but they make up for it at times because they have the ability to extend plays on the back end. I believe anticipation allows you to extend plays on the front end. It allows you to be able to do things that other guys can't do. And so that's where I see the value of anticipation, where a lot of people, you know, see value in extending plays and extending plays. Anticipation does that because it allows you to make plays. It allows you to make throws that other guys aren't able to make and that windows that close up on other guys you're able to make them. So you're extending that play similarly to a, a player on the back end. Um, you know, when it comes to anticipation, I, and I'm actually doing a piece um, about this in the next coming month um, on NFL Plus. So uh, anybody listening, go check it out because it'll have some visual evidence to go along with what I'm talking about. But I, but I believe there's two aspects of anticipation. And the first one is, is timing. The ability to throw to a spot. The ability to have that nuance with your wide receiver to understand when he's going to break, when he's going to come out of his break. Can I let this ball go early before the defense is able to react and get there? So that's the first part is 
is the timing. And I know a lot of people think, well, everybody has, no, everybody doesn't have that same timing. Everybody can't see it three steps ahead of when they have to throw it. And so the other part with anticipation is allows you to throw the ball different ways. If I'm a second later, even though I'm trying to throw with timing, I got to drive the throw. I've got to throw it through a guy to hit a window. If I can anticipate and see that two steps ahead of another quarterback, now I can lay the ball. I can lay it over the top of a linebacker. I can layer it into different spots, which again, allow me to be more successful on different kinds of throws because I can throw it different ways and I can throw it earlier or later depending on what I see. And then the second part of anticipation is the ability to see and manipulate the defense. Uh, it's the ability to see defenders uh, with their hip tur hips turned a certain direction or their momentum taking them a certain direction. And now I can throw the ball into a spot, not waiting for my guy to get open, but throw it to a spot because I've manipulated the defense and I've seen how the play has manipulated their, their bodies where I can throw it ahead of time. Again, look at pressure right? The ability to release the ball earlier helps you to avoid pressure, bad situations, sacks. And so anticipation to me is a huge element, uh, especially for guys like myself that weren't the most athletic guys, you know, that didn't make, um, you know, extend the plays on the back end. My gift was to be able to extend the play on the front end, to be able to extend a, an offensive play call because I had more ways in which I could throw the football more times in which I could throw the football within the course of, you know, the, the first element of the play. And so those were where, um, you know, for me, uh, you know, where I was able to get away with certain things, um, you know, lacking some of those things physically that some other quarterbacks have. Going to the game's not supposed to be stressful. It's supposed to be fun. Now, maybe your team, like the Panthers, causes you a lot of stress. but finding the logistics of going to the game is supposed to be easy. And with game time, it is game time with the NFL schedule here. Uh, you can get yourself ready for the upcoming season, find all the tickets for all the games that you want to attend to and save up to 60% off buying your tickets last minute with sports concerts, comedy theater, and more with their flash deals and zone deals. They have all in pricing. So you, there's no surprises when you put the tickets into your cart and go to check out and I love their panoramic view so you can see the sight lines from your seat before you make the decision to purchase your tickets. And with the Game Time Ticket Guarantee, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference if you find cheaper tickets in the same row and section for less. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On NFL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. And then, you know, I'll just touch on, you know, the nuance you talked about because I, I show a couple of plays uh, in my piece also about this idea. I can't tell you how many times in my career where I let the ball go and all I saw was, you know, the whatever, the, the two and the three of the defensive back and the ball was going right between their numbers. And the idea was, well, I trusted my guys on the outside and I had some great ones to throw to, you know, especially in St. Louis with Isaac and Tory, their route running and, and their ability to get in out of breaks was phenomenal. And so we played really, really well together, but I would let the ball go right at the defensive back. And then at the last second, boom, here comes Isaac or here comes Tory to, to undercut that and, you know, and make the play. But, you know, every once in a while, there's going to be a time where I hit the defensive back in the numbers and, and people are going to be like, what's he doing? He threw it right at the guy. And, you know, all it takes is a little slip or, you know, a, a little bend that's a little deeper than you expect, because that's where anticipation comes in is trying to be on the same page with your receiver on a particular look where I expect him to be at this spot at this time. And every once in a while, that's going to go against you. Now, does that mean we throw it all out? No, because I think we made more plays uh, playing that way. But there will be times if you throw with anticipation that something happens on the back end that isn't what you expect, that it's played a little bit differently or receiver does something a little bit differently on the top of the route, and it's going to lead to some interception. So you always have to understand that when you watch anticipatory throwers and you have to look at all the elements, not just what happened at the end of the play, 
but what happened throughout the play that maybe messed up that timing because it is so crucial if you're going to play that way. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I'm hearing you describe this. And I kind of laugh because I think about so many two throws where like the zone defender almost like freezes. He's like, Oh, it's, it's coming right towards me. And you think, yep. Hey, if he drives on that and he beats it to the spot, he's going to get it. But they almost get, just get like the deer in the headlights. It's coming right at me. And then you see that receiver that swoops in exactly like you were talking about. Yep. You're exactly right because they're not used to that. And so when they're sitting back there and the ball starts coming at them, you're right. They want to kind of hang there and wait like, okay, it's coming right at me. I'm just going to make this interception. And they kind of lose sight of what's going on around them. And that's when, boom, you want your guy to kind of undercut them and uh, and hit that spot perfectly. But you're, you're exactly right. You know, it's, it's tough when a guy's kind of a backpedal playing on the deep end of the field and the ball comes right at them for them to drive on the football. They're usually just waiting for it. And, and that's, an element that we use uh, in our favor uh, from an offensive perspective. Like going back to you talking about the anticipation of of what direction a guy's hips are turned or, or his feet are moving to be able to understand that leverage and that transition time. Uh, you mentioned Tory and Isaac and, and that greatest show on turf. I know a lot of people kind of struggle with Tua with compartmentalizing Tyreek and Jalen Waddell and Mike McDaniel and this running game that had Raheem Mostert and Devon Achan last year. Uh, you mentioned Isaac and Torrey, but Marshall Falk and, and a Hall of Fame head coach and Dick Vermeil and Orlando Pace on the offensive line is a Hall of Famer. Even Asa Hakeem and uh, Ricky Prohl, you know, guys that were really, really good NFL players. And then you go to Arizona and you have three 1,000-yard receivers in a single season. Mm -hmm. For you, I'd love your perspective on, and you touched on it a little bit, trying to compartmentalize a player's individual skills and weighing that out, you know, when, when we're talking about potentially paying to a tongue of a top of market contract, some people really struggle with the idea of, yeah, but look at him in a vacuum, but it doesn't, does, does it really work in a vacuum or, or do you feel like with what you experienced in Arizona and then St. Louis, the two totally different situations with two totally different skill groups. If you find players that compound the strengths of what you're doing, it's really all all of the the sum of the whole versus the sum of the individual parts. Yeah, you know, I I have said numerous times, you know, we we have this cliche that we talk about uh, around NFL circles, and um, you know, oftentimes it's a negative when we say, "Oh, he's a system quarterback." I'm a firm believer that everyone or most guys are system quarterbacks. In other words, they have things that they do really really well. And so you want to cater your system or cater the guys around you to what your quarterback does well. And, you know, that's just, you know, it just makes sense that you're going to do that. You've got some guys that, you know, probably have the ability to extend and play beyond that. But what I'm saying is, is, is you develop a system that plays to that quarterback, the way he sees the game, the way he likes to play the game. Great example for me is you mentioned it. You know, won two MVPs in St. Louis, um, you know, went back to the Super Bowl, had three 1,000-yard receivers in Arizona. But then there was a year I was in, in New York. And in New York, nobody thought I could play anymore. You know, everybody was like, oh, my gosh, this guy's terrible. What's going on? Well, the system there didn't play to what I did. We wanted to run the football, play defense, and throw it on third down when we had to. And so it was completely away from my, you know, my skill set and, and my strengths as a quarterback. So – we, I had to figure out a different way to play there, but then put me back in a system that plays back to my strengths and I'm able to excel again. And so um, the, the thing about like a, a tour or, or really any core, but very few quarterbacks have gone from one place to another place and had great success. You know, if you look at the quarterbacks that have done that, you know, we're talking about Hall of Fame type quarterbacks. So the key is. You got to look at Tua within the situation that you have. You, you can't, you know, put him in a vacuum and go, well, you know, will he be this good everywhere? Will he be this good without Tyreek and without Jalen? And the answer is, I don't know, but we don't have to care about that. All we have to care about is this is our situation. This is the offense we're going to run. These are the players that we have. Is Tua the right quarterback to pay for the next three, four, five years uh, and commit to him? believing that he gives us a great opportunity to be successful within this situation. 
And, I, you know, I don't know. I, I definitely think because of some of the things that I talked about with Tua and some of the shortcomings, if he was playing in a different system, if he was playing with some different guys, um, you know, that that speed of, of those players and the scheme that they use allow that anticipation to be such a huge part of what they do. So if he's playing in another system where they don't have those guys, I don't know if Tua is quite as successful as he's been, but that's not the point. The point is, if we found the guy to fit our system and our players, do we sign that guy to a big deal? And that's the question that you have to answer, not take him off the team and say, what if? I mean, you know, we could all do that. You know, what, what if I was placed into Tom Brady's situation for 20 years in New England? How many times would I have been in the Super Bowl? How many times would Peyton Manning have been in the Super Bowl? You know, you go back to Joe Montana. Well, if I would have played on those great San Francisco teams, what would my – like, we could do that all day long, but none of it matters because it's what do you do with your situation, situation that you're in and, and, and the fit that you have. Um, and I think that holds true for the teams as well. Teams have to decide, okay – do we want to go forward with this guy? Does he fit what we're trying to do? And do we believe he can take us to the next step? And the quarterbacks or the players have to do the same thing. And so I just, I think it's always unfair uh, to try to take someone out of their situation and go, well, if he was over here, would you pay him? You know, we're doing the same thing with Brock Purdy. Um, you know, that he's playing with all these great players around him. And another thing I would argue, all great quarterbacks or Hall of Fame quarterbacks played with great players. Like they had yeah. great players around them in different ways. So, you know, that should never be a knock on anybody. I mean, go look at Joe Montana in the San Francisco uniform and the players he had around him. And then you look at Brock Purdy. And so we knock guys for things like that that just makes no sense. If he's in a perfect fit and it works for the team and the player, then you have to consider paying that player um, as the market shows. You know, I'm a firm believer that I would love to see all players, you know, kind of, um, you know, slated where maybe they fit in the National Football League. You know, where Stua maybe isn't a Patrick Mahomes yet or a Lamar Jackson or, or those types of guys. So, you know, let's fit him underneath it. I think we all know how the league works is, hey, right. if you're up, you're going to try up. to set the market. So the next guy can set the market and, and go from there. Um, and so. You know, I think you have to consider with what Tua has done and way he fits that system, um, you know, giving him that big market type deal. I, I have two more questions for you, and I know we're getting into the economics of quarterbacks. And you mentioned yourself and your style of play with anticipation, not being necessarily the best athlete. And I think that's one of the questions that a lot of Dolphins fans have as far as if you do make the big financial commitment, you can't pay everybody forever. Uh, and, and as to a, not the biggest or the fastest or the yeah. strongest arm throwers, people question, okay, what's the sustainability look like after this current iteration of his supporting cast has to undergo some change. I would love to hear from you as far as early in your career, you have hall of famers all around you. You mentioned the transition to New York with a different scheme. Uh, and then you go to Arizona. What was your maturation like as a quarterback, having that kind of influence of so many Hall of Fame caliber players around you into as you transitioned into New York and Arizona? How did you change as a player? Um, well, I mean, sometimes your mindset has to change. You know, I, I think a great example is uh, I always tell people open for, you know, Tory Hold and Isaac Bruce was different than open for. Uh, Larry Fitzgerald and Anquan Bolden. And so that was part of my transition is I was used to seeing space, you know, quickness and explosiveness out of breaks by the guys in St. Louis. So I could see space and, and that meant open for me in St. Louis. When I went to Arizona, it was different. It was about positioning. I had two big receivers. So it wasn't the same as throwing to a Tyreek Hill that's going to create this separation because of his speed. But it didn't mean that I couldn't use those strengths that I used in St. Louis in Arizona as well. Um, and so that becomes such a big part of the maturation process is realizing, you know, every player is not going to be Marshall Falk or Isaac Bruce or Torrey Holt. But it doesn't mean you can't still be successful and you still can't play in a similar type fashion. I still played with anticipation. 
right? I, I still played, you know, with those things and allowed accuracy to be my greatest strength. It was, it just looked a little bit differently than it did, uh, you know, in St. Louis. And so that becomes a part of the process it is, is figuring out what your strengths are and how to use those strengths with different guys. You know, another thing for me was, uh, was understanding how to use the guys within an offense, um, you know, that maybe I didn't understand quite as much when I was in St. Louis, I was young and a play, and now it's like, okay, I got different players. What do we need to do with these different players? What do they do well? You know, what are their strengths? What routes do they run really, really well? And how does that play into now what I do as a quarterback? So that's part of the maturation process is, you know, learning different guys, learning yourself to the point uh, where you understand, even though it might look a little bit different or we may have to play a little different scheme, how can I still be successful because I don't have to do something dramatically different? What we did in New York was dramatically different from what I was as a quarterback. Now, we still won games, and that's what I had to mature and figure out was, okay, you're not going to win games throwing the ball for 300 yards and three touchdowns a game. That's not what we're going to do here. You got to learn how to win as a leader and making those plays in critical situations and, and not making mistakes uh, more than making plays. So I matured in so many different ways, but I think the biggest thing is, and kind of as you're talking about, is you transition from, you know, one, uh, I'll say regime or, or one, you know, it's not really going to be an era, but, but period of time to the next period of time when you've got different players around you and you, you may have to change what, uh, what schematically you're doing, you have to understand OK, who are the guys I'm, I'm playing with? How do my strengths connect with them? And then those strengths that have always made me successful. I have to keep doing those things. I have to stay in that mode. How do I stay in that mode when I'm doing it with different guys and when I'm playing with other players that may have different strengths than the guys, you know, early in my career? And and that's always a part of the process. You know, I, Tom Brady, I think, is always a great example of this, is that he played with a lot of different guys. You know, I mean, he plays with the Wes Welkers, who's great in his own right, but he's completely different than the Randy Mosses. And so he's got different periods where he plays with different guys. You know, sometimes it's the tight ends, you know, Gronk down the middle of the field. And so the ability to evolve your skill set to the players you have around me is always key for longevity and consistency at the quarterback position. And, you know, there's no question, you know, if when Tyreek is gone, uh, you know, a guy that has speed like we've rarely seen in this, uh, you know, in this, um, you know, league, when he's gone, it's going to be different throwing the football to other guys that don't, you know, create fear in the defense, that don't get the same sort of separation. So that will be the maturation process for, you know, whether it's this offense as a whole uh, or Tua, you know, as different guys come in and out of the lineup. And the last one, if I may bring this conversation full circle, you talked about some of the shortcomings that you saw this past season and so much of their bread and butter is establishing the wide zone running game, building their play action, passing off of that, getting horizontal flow on the second level to create throwing windows to throw over the middle of the field. And when it worked, it was great. And when it didn't work, they didn't have that other pitch to kind of come back on to. Uh, they've kind of dropped directly or indirectly some breadcrumbs this offseason. Odell Beckham, uh, when he did his introductory press conference, talked about he talked with Mike McDaniel about the struggles that they had when teams bracketed both Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle on third downs. Uh, Mike McDaniel was asked about Johnu Smith, who they added at tight end, and said, anytime you can get a player like that who with the ball in his hands can make you pay when you get drop seven and they play with a lot of depth and you get a big physical guy to kind of run with the ball in his hands, uh, it's a nice added element to the offense. Were there any other elements aside of pressure plans and play designs to, to kind of promote deeper progression passing that stood that stand out to you that you'd maybe like to see that can't necessarily be solved by, Oh, we got a different player to be the third wide receiver or the de facto tight end. Yeah. I mean, I think so much of it and it's always the give and take, you know, I see the same thing happen at times in San Francisco and the same thing at times in LA, you know, they all come from that same kind of background, that Shanahan background where, so much of what they do in the past game is predicated off of motions and play action where we're going to distort the defense with our scheme, which allows us to get our number one read more often. 
what I would love to see is just them continuing to expand their their passing game to the point where it's not just the scheme um, opening up guys, but the actual play design will create open guys for Tua. So to, to me, it, it's better complementary pieces to that original play that they're going to run. You know, they're going to run kind of the, the quick in or, or the skinny post over and over again, um, you know, throwing it in uh, inside the numbers, but in by the hash. And they're going to try to hit that over and over in a game. And a lot of it comes, you know, you motion a guy, you know, fast motion a guy out. You're trying to pull that linebacker a little bit so you can throw it by, behind him. Or the play action, pull that guy up so you can throw it behind him on that skinny post. But, you know, there are things that say, okay, who are we throwing the skinny post off of? But we're throwing it off the outside backer. Well, let's make sure that we overload that outside linebacker zone. So if that throw isn't open, Tua feeds, feels really comfortable going, oh, that guy took that away. This guy must be open. And it speeds up the process of, you know, getting from one to two. It makes you more comfortable going from one to two because everything is a little bit more connected with that timing and that anticipation that Tua wants to play with. So he's not forcing that first throw and he feels more comfortable playing the game and allow the game to come to him. And that's when I think we can truly see, does Tua have that element in his game? Does he have the ability to process one to two to three and do it quickly and understand what he's seeing defensively as opposed to just coming back and trying to see, hey, can I make that throw to the receiver let the defense dictate that, and that to me is where you're always going to be more successful as a quarterback, knowing, hey, this guy can only take away one of these two guys. If I read it right, we're going to have success more often than me trying to throw it around him and see if I can fit it into my first receiver, which sometimes feels like um, you know, the design or the goal of the offense or, or, or Tua. Kurt Warner, Pro Football Hall of Famer, NFL Network analyst. This was absolutely wonderful conversation. I cannot thank you enough for taking some time out of your day and joining me, Kurt. Thank you so much. You got it. Happy to be on. And that is going to do it for us here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. Kyle Krabs joined by Kurt Warner to talk in depth about the Dolphins, their offense, Tua, all things Miami, an outstanding conversation. Not that I would have expected anything less from an NFL network analyst, but also a pro football Hall of Fame quarterback who played the game in some ways and with some players around him that had some parallels to what we are seeing in Miami. I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Make it a great rest of your day. Fins up. I am out of here.